we'll start off just uh, um, talking a little bit about uh, the Fedora Core OS and, and, and what it is that we have here. So uh, um, effectively, this is um, an introduction to immutable OS uh, modifications to the, so you start, we start with um, in the Fedora Core OS world, a universal image and that universal image is applied in all uh, all domains. Uh, so so wherever wherever it is that you're deploying, you're deploying the same thing. And um, and then modifications are made through uh, through through scripts that are introduced at the time of boot um, to make modifications. So we're going to go through uh, some of the the process for first off uh, configuring a system to run. Um, a virtual instance, and then uh, dig into what the uh, uh, what the initial experience looks like, and how to just have a uh, command line connection to a system for uh, review. So, I'm going to take you through a little bit of what's going what's going to get us started here. So, first off, we need to make sure that any system we're using um, is uh, configured. Um, for uh, virtualization, and uh, just a quick and easy way to to uh, to make sure that that's installed is uh, to go to the getting started page uh, for the prereqs on our lab for lib virtualization, and I stood up. Um, I have a throwaway system for doing this uh, th that I have set up from a launch template on um, AWS. So I have a workshop instance. I have one that's fully baked. And um, so I'm just going to very quickly go through the, uh, that's interesting. The tutorial so you can add the virtualization immediately uh, to the system uh, once we have the uh, the install completed uh, we can start the virt the libvirtd And we'll go through that. Um, once we have that enabled, we'll look for uh, the KVM uh, configuration and make sure that shows up. The instance here that I've chosen has a KVM Intel support. So we can, um, uh, we'll, we'll uh, uh, once we get to this spot, we can start the standard tutorial for um, for the uh, for the prerequisites for uh, the Fedora Core OS deployment. So while it's uh, going in the background, let's just look over here. Um, we're gonna. I'm gonna go ahead and do this uh, first process. This first part of the class with um, with standard libvirt virtualization because we want to log in directly to the system without having set up any uh, configured users. Um, obviously this will uh, this will get you into the um, the base image and then we'll uh, do some inspection on that base image but we're going to start uh, with some some housekeeping. Um, we're going to make the directory uh, where we're going to store our um, artifacts and required files. So now let's see if you can see this. Um, so now I'm uh, I'm in the uh, in that directory proper. I'm going to go ahead and let's 
start my libvirts. Make sure that it comes back when I need it to. And then just verify uh, that I'm running the Intel uh, CPU extensions. Yes. And now we'll move over here. So all of the basic tools that we require are, uh, well, there's these three tools uh, that are associated. So the first thing we're, we're working on is um, a configuration file that will pass to the instance itself. And that comes in the form of an ignition file. The ignition file um, provides all the parameters and it's a little bit like um, a, a, a predecessor there uh, called CloudInit. Um, but this one was written by the CoreOS team and, and is uh, much faster, a little more robust in terms of the configuration and operations. And we're gonna write, but it's written in JSON and, and a lot of people like to write in, in YAML. And we have a, a Fedora CoreOS configuration file that's, that is uh, uh, used to generate um, or, or is something that's built in human readable. And then we have the, the transpiler, um, the FCCT, that will, uh, will actually uh, change that file into a, um, or convert the file into an ignition, an actual ignition file. And the ignition file gets passed in the user data, user data configuration for an instance, or uh, you'll set a parameter uh, for where that will be pulled. So uh, these three utilities, the FCCT, the transpiler, um, the uh, CoreOS installer, which is used to, to um, retrieve the image that you want, and then the ignition validate, the ignition validate will verify that the ignition file that was created from our transpiler at, includes information that is valid for the, um, for the ignition file. Uh, these tools are available in a couple of different ways. Uh, one is we can download and install them uh, uh, from the, uh, to a Fedora instance that we're using or we can pull them and use them interactively. And the easiest way to pull and use them interactively is to create these aliases for the utilities. You can see the utilities have uh, been assigned an alias that's associated with the, the um, uh, container in this case. But, uh, we can just use the packages. So let's just make sure that these should be installed by default. Okay, so now we have those. Uh, and the next thing we want to do is download the image uh, that we want. So in this case, we're going to download the latest uh, Fedora 33 or FCOS uh, 33, so door 4OS 33 coming right up. And to make this easier on ourselves, uh, we're gonna use the same process that's here in this, um, in this step. This step is just renaming uh, the QEMU file that you're, you're pulling down for, uh, for use in the configuration. So now we have a file. Checking the signature. And uh, we can move that to Something a little easier for us to digest. The Fedora Core S QCal2. So now we are now we have changed what we downloaded into this file. Uh, 
Uh, let's look. I want to take just a second to go over what's happening here. Um, this is pulling the uh, latest stable build um, based on the release signature, and the release signature is, comes from somewhere, right? It comes from your uh, from your configuration. The configuration we can get. Let's see from. this URI. If I wanted to pull that information for myself so that I could say, see what, what that release is, actually that's just there. I can do a curl um, and pull the content from that uh, stream, the CoreOS stream. This is awesome, by the way. It's one of my favorite um, ways to, to pull in the image that I need for a dynamic build. So if I'm uh, building from, for a, uh, uh, just an automated process, this is very helpful. And then I can choose based on the, the region. Uh, so I'm looking for images here in AWS, just as an example, but I've got the release information here. That release information is associated um, in our, uh, in our tutorial that's associated here. So I can just pull uh, that release information from the command line as is shown here, and then leverage it to uh, grab the latest image. And then I can verify that signature by pulling from the same location and, and verifying it. And then I can uncompress that file, which is all handled. That's all been handled for us by the CoreOS installer. Uh, and then uh, this is just, just discussing the initial configuration for those utilities that we were talking about. All right. So this is this is the uh, Fedora CoreOS uh, configuration file, and in this case, uh, our first ignition file is just going to uh, give us access to uh, a running system. Uh, you can see we have some version information here. This is all uh, basic, and then we skip uh, directly to so we don't modify anything that's associated with users and that's usually what happens here is there's the, the hierarchy here looks like users system uh, and then uh, your storage association the systemd configuration here is just giving us the auto login and then we're making some modifications to the files so that we are not uh, beholden to the pager and uh, we're making some changes so let's just take this information. If you're doing this at your leisure, uh, you can grab, you know, you can uh, uh, bring that in uh, the hard way, but we're not going to do that. We're going to um, we're going to grab this here. So just like we had it in uh, in the uh, web page, we have it here. Now we have an auto login file, uh, and that matches the name that we wanted to give it up here. I guess this is YAML. Not I left out the A, and 
Now we'll convert this. We're going to convert it from the uh, Fedora Core OS configuration to the ignition configuration. Um, just move over here and I downloaded this. So now I can say, I want you to pretty print it in there. I want you the strips. I want this file and I want the output to go to uh, auto login dot IGN. And now I'll go back. Let's look at the auto login IGN and see that that's very nicely configured and uh, ready to go. So now I don't have it to save anything. I can move over here and we can take this detail and validate it. So now we're going to use our ignition validate the command line to determine if that file indeed is a valid ignition file. And we see that it is. And uh, Dusty provided us with this handy little uh, um, and so we could have uh, some feedback that was recognizable. And take this opportunity to modify the context on the ignition file so that it will uh, slurp up into the, the vert install. And now we're going to do just a standard vert virtualization of vert install on this instance. And because it's auto login, Should be CoreOS auto login. All good. We all also know that it's Fedora CoreOS stable because that's what we downloaded. And now we're just building an image or an instance. So we have just a simple virtual machine here. Funny enough, inside a virtual machine. <laughs> So surprise, uh, there is no configuration for our users. So we just go straight to the prompt. And this is a very easy way to, to just have a quick experience with the instance itself. Um, so this is where we are. And these are some of the things that we can do. We can walk through um, what we're getting out of the ring. And then we can uh, look at uh, the host name information. In this case, I don't think we actually set the host name. Oh, yeah, we do. Okay. What was that? Is this not it? Yeah, here we go. So you can see we set the host name here. Okay, so you can see that's pretty quick and easy. So if you were doing this, you could you could uh, spawn a, spawn as many as you want to. I have room for one, <laughs> um, and uh, you can see here that we're using the this OS variant is um, an important definition for your vert install uh, command to get the right. Uh, to get the right configuration. So if you're looking for that, uh, that's an important thing. If you have an older version of Libvirt, uh, the Libvirt utilities, you may, you may not find that. So make sure you're using a current version. Um, <clears throat> here's the commands. <coughs> I'm gonna let you uh, go ahead and go through the CoreOS exploration yourself so you can find these, um, these interesting and important RPMs. 
uh, and consider that these are uh, parts of the uh, of the base OS. And this is an important uh, distinction here. This is the we'll just go here and look at the OS tree and see that this is our the base of our uh, operating system. This is a container in itself. And if we update this, we would, in fact, uh, get an entire replacement for uh, not just the kernel or a single package, but a collection of packages that make up the uh, base operating system, the base deployment. OK. In the interest of time, uh, I'm going to let you uh, walk through those commands yourself. And I'm going to destroy this virtual machine so that we can move on to the next one. Really? Oh. And I'm going to get out of here. Sorry, that's a control <laughs> uh, right bracket. <laughs> Surprise. And now uh, there is a verse command. <laughs> and uh, the undefined. I've only got about, yeah, I've got 40 gig of space. So <clears throat> two of these would, uh, or 25 gig. Okay. So, um, so we're working with a 25 gig uh, root volume. And in the definition for the instance, it's set, or the, the uh, virtual machine, you can see we've, we're setting a disk size uh, that is um, pretty much pretty much the same. OK. So now let's, uh, let's move on to the second tutorial. Let's assume we are having a machine that uh, is actually running on cloud or something like on a public network. And you would like to get to know the IP of uh, that specific instance. And what we can do is uh, use something like console login helper messages to actually so so uh, yeah. So let's assume we have a machine and we would like to get to know the public uh, IP address of it. So we can totally do that from this script that is like just uh, using curl to actually get uh, to actually get uh, a ip pool dot i can has ip dot com and then uh, pushing it into uh, console login helper messages and that will be like uh, once uh, fedora os boots up it will be demonstrated or be visible at at the console so here is the systemd service around this uh, bash file what it's going to do is uh, it will execute that bash script file and then then it will uh, actually be uh, be used before the be executed before this thing before this service executes the control login helper message one so as david as david demonstrated with the enabling auto login and the custom host name we will be doing the same but uh, like the same provisioning method that'll be ignition and we'll be writing a yaml file for doing it so what it's doing is that uh, first of all we are making sure that we are able to auto login without having to uh, do anything like ssh and stuff along with that we are also defining another systemd unit uh, systemd service which will execute this public IPv4, which will actually hit uh, I can have IP and get the IP address and show it on the console. Along with that, we are modifying the host name and uh, telling the systemd pager to actually use cat, to use cat not a pager when printing information. Along with that, we are actually, these things are actually done to make sure that uh, we have the work, 
the workflow for the workshop goes smoothly because like if uh, the control log message logging level is a uh, debug that's actually seven that will show all the audit messages on the interactive control so uh, we are changing it to warning four and uh, along with that we are also adding a script as public ip4.sh in our path so i have actually written this uh, ignition file here fcct yeah, uh, here it is so here it is we are just modifying the host name and that will be defcon minus cz minus 2021 and most of the information is similar then what's on the documentation uh, so i'm not using fedora on this on this laptop so i'm using some like docker to actually make sure that my uh, yaml file uh, is converted directly into it so let's see how that works uh, yeah so if we could get uh, the services that ignition file it's JSON, which uh, actually the Fedora OS config transpiler read to the YAML file and created this ignition config that we will be using to provision the Fedora OS. So I'm going to quickly clear it out and then search for work install. So what work install is doing is creating another virtual machine, which uh, will be using this uh, specific ignition config from the QEMU command line and creating a backing store for 20 gb and using that so let's try and provision it let's see how that works so it actually created another virtual machine and as you can see it's booting up So it's taking quite some time to can you increase your font size? Uh, dude, I'm not sure who's responsible for the icon has the IPI. He's a big hand. I'm not sure on that one, but uh, yeah, sure. I'll increase the font size. So uh, it is actually booting up here. So I'm not sure if I'll be able to do that, but. Uh, yeah, there it is. So here's something. It's trying to boot up, and uh, it'll soon show us our public IP address on uh, the console. This is what console login helper messages is demonstrating, uh, and then uh, it is building the ignition file system. And then setting up the one. Just booting up the virtual machine and There is our service. And so here you can see that uh, along with the ignition and SSH host keys, we have uh, a script that was executed and has actually detected public IPv4, uh, IP address that detected, and there's a public IPv4 address for it. So it's, uh, it logged in automatically because as we used ignition to actually create the service and uh, execute the service so we can actually get the logs from here uh, this is what the service is all about that we create from the ignition config file so it actually used curl to actually talk to icon has ip.com and 
you start to, to execute the script and get the uh, IP address. Oops, sorry. So this is how ignition works and you can execute multiple scripts or use something like a systemd service that will be that will be responsible for executing your uh, script and that uh, service can be uh, executed once like network is online or anything you would like and you can demonstrate useful information using control login helper messages issued in dot service to actually show something on after log before logging in when you provision a machine so this is my first part uh, and uh, this was about uh, uh, using systemd services the second one is about enabling ssh service ssh access and starting containers on boot let's assume that we have a machine and we would like to enable uh, we would like to create an HTT, the uh, distributed HTT uh, program, and make it as a member. So, do that on a, in a container. So, HTT will actually be running in a container. In order to do that, we will be using Podman, which is like very similar, uh, similar to Docker, and uh, it runs rootless for rootless containers. So, we will be creating two services here. The first one will be a failure service, which will be one shot and it'll be just doing false so it'll actually result a uh, non-zero code which will result in a failure and fedora cos uh, after boot time it'll show us that this service was failed while trying to load it via admission and at the same time we'll be creating another service that will actually be an hcd container and that will be a member so we uh created the service for it and then we have the storage files and the modifications that we use for this uh, tutorial so i'm quickly going to exit it and uh, i'm going to quickly destroy it as well so we can use the same name for the other for this tutorial so I'm going to set and then continue it on first boot. So here's the FCCP containers ignition file part where, where I'm adding my public SSH key that I generated to the source workshop. Along with that, we have another service that's going to enable auto login. Along with that, we have a failure one which will fail. And then we have an STD number. So I'm quickly going to convert it into uh, the FCCT one. So that will be actually the uh, Docker one. So I'm quickly going to modify it to containers. So a quick note here, you will not have to type uh, all of it because like in the very start, uh, while setting up, uh, it was said that you have to set some aliases, but I didn't do that. So I have to type all the container running stuff on the command line. So the ignition config files here. Uh, here it is a guide for all the, can, uh, all the YAML files converted into a JSON ignition format. And then we can use this one to create a virtual machine. So I am quickly going to modify the QEMU command line from services.ignition to containers.ign. So what we'll do is uh, use this new in the ignition file to create this instance. We're going to time in the meantime, do we have any questions? Oh, it's major hidden. Okay. Thanks, David. I just got to know that. So, Timothy, in the meantime, would you like to go ahead and uh, tell some information about CoreOS or anything really while this thing boots up and is pulling the SCD image? Um, I we don't have. Um, so, 
here the again, examples that we are giving are relatively simple and, and like direct examples, uh, but you can do a lot of things with uh, ignition and flow across. So as a more, I would say, complex example, uh, I can share one we made with uh, Matrix, uh, setting up Matrix server uh, on published that in Fedora magazine. Um, uh, where you can set up or automatically automatically set up uh, a matrix uh, on server uh, via only ignition configs uh, on on Fedora Core S, and that's really powerful because if you do it uh, once, then that's time a lot of time to set up and everything to write the configs. But if you want to automatically set up uh, more of those servers or do that for several domains, for example, several instances, then uh, once you've done that the first time, uh, every single new instance is free, basically, because you've got all the configs and you can go ahead and start again. And so we published this uh, this full example so that uh, it gives you an idea of how much power Ignition has and how much capabilities it has so that you can use it in more context. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Timothy. Uh, I think the machine has booted up here. You can see that the failure service that we actually created just to fail is demonstrate is here that the console login helper message is, is telling us that this was a failed unit that you are trying to provision via ignition. And the other service that we created is our service. So we we'll just quickly go and see the logs of it. So it actually pulled the image and it started a single node XCD cluster. Uh, by using this image. So we are quickly going to see and add something here. So what we're going to do is like create a key value pair for Fedora and then adding value as fun. So I'm going to do that. And here you can see that it replied this with actions at node key Fedora value this and modified index this. So now let's get this key from from it. So what we're going to do is we are going to quickly use JQ. Okay. So here you can see that we are when the single node cluster is up, as the single node cluster is up, we can add uh, the uh, key value pairs or at the same time fetch data from it. We can use it to purge in your case cluster and use it as a part of case cluster if you are setting up multi node uh, multi node uh, XTD. So you can like set, up, set that up easily by adding it in the ignition template. So Timothy, would you like to go ahead and uh, share yours? And we can destroy it by this way. So you have to press control and the square ending bracket. So when you do that, it will like uh, get you out of the domain tree virtual machine and then you can destroy and define it. Uh, sorry. So then you can use the same name to create other virtual machines as well. So stop sharing my screen now. All right. Should I move forward? Okay. So now we will uh, try and test updates. So. Um, the what, what's nice with Fedora Cores is that it automatically updates. So, um, yeah, we, okay, all right, yes, we are we are at the end of the. So yeah, if you have any questions, feel free, and we'll stop and and answer them. Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll just like try and we can do some of the other tutorials, or we can ask we we can ask also answer questions too if that's. If there are any. Well, we don't see anything in Q&A section, uh, Timothy. Okay. Um, I think uh, you, you already answered uh, all the answer on the chat. So. All right. Thank uh, you. Show us, yeah. Um, yeah do good. we have Do we have time to do to for Timothy to show the update? Because I think that's an important yeah, yeah, part yeah, of the. Yeah. Yeah. Would you do that, Timothy? Yeah. Till uh, one thirty, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. 
All right, I'll do. I'll do the. Um, I'm also show, show the Thanks. dates so that Thanks for that could be recorded, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, the idea is that Fedora OS is an automatically updating system. So once you, I'll share the, the the page at the same time. That should help. Here we go. So once you've installed the system, it will automatically stay up to date and reboot, reboot to, to apply the, the next update. Um, essentially, we release updates, uh, something like every two weeks. So every two weeks, you get a new update, unless there's a major uh, security issue, and then we, we release updates when, it, when it's needed. So to do that, to actually test the update, usually you, when you start a Fedora course instance, you directly start it at the latest version. Uh, so, because we, you don't need to start off with something that, that is already outdated. Uh, but um, to do that, we will like download an exact, uh, just previous version so that we can actually have updates um, working. So let's just do that. So I'll pick up uh, a release. Here's another uh, release from, uh, from Fedora. So um, that's what I will do here. So if you go ahead and look at the stable stream, for example, you can just pick up the previous one here and copy this value and, and use that to download the release. So I'll do just that. Um, should I, maybe I should have share. All right, let's download the signature and we verify the release. Oh, oh yeah, because <laughs> It's been a while since I've downloaded uh, the images uh, manually, so I have to fetch out the signing key, which is uh, which is where signing key, which is over here. All right. No, that should be good. Yes, that's good. All right. So now that we have an older release, we can uh, simply boot up that one. We'll just extract the image. move it under more predictable name, and then we go. So we don't need like a really complex uh, configuration here. So the FCC isn't really interesting. So I'll just copy it and paste it. You, you can you can find it in the, in the doc. I'll just copy paste. And we'll use that directly. Whoops, oops, oops, oops. Too fast. Yeah. Okay. FCC. Let's go. Let's have it here. So it's essentially the same one as we used before with auto login and eventually an SSH key. So we can have that here. I'll just paste my my own SSH key. Here we go. Great. So, as always, we convert this here to a new mission config. If I wrote, yes, because I wrote it FCC. All right. So, we have our, our updates in mission config, and we can go and start a virtual machine with that. So what's nice here, so we have a two updates. So what's going to happen is that directly after we boot up, the system will immediately 
figure out that it's not up to date and we'll start doing the updates. So if we do ask, if we look at the status of the Incari, which is the update, the, the program which manages the update of Fedora Forest, you look at what he, he finds out, he's uh, okay, he's running here. Oh, he failed to check for updates. Hmm. Oh, no, he, he failed to check, but it actually managed to do that. So, and we're already rebooting up. So we were on old versions, but we immediately noticed that and we immediately re rebooted the system. So here we go. We know back. And let's take a look at the status of our system, which with RPM registry, which is the command that manages the system and how to and which version we are running. And what we can see here is so we started on this version here, which, which is the version that I got from um, from the from the download page, uh, the, the version that I actually used to, to set up the, the, the virtual machine, and we immediately moved moved out to the latest version. You see here the the latest the stable version. Um, yeah, so we basically the Gary noticed that we were running something old and said, "Okay, that's good. Uh, we." You're ready. You you you're running an older version. Let's go and update right up. Uh, so if we look at the status of the Ngadi here, uh, so right now, yeah, we are in the current release. So that's good because before he was saying that we were. If I just look at the the journal from the full journal uh, from um, the Ngadi, which I think I can get. Um, Got it. Oh yeah, I just have to go ahead and get it. Uh, so yes, initially he he was like, okay, current release is not a dead end, it's not the latest version, and we want to move to the latest version. So that's what he did first, and now we're on the we rebooted and we know we're on the latest one. So if if we're there, okay, all right, we got automatic updates, but What's great is that we can check out what happened between the versions. So directly in, in, in our system here, we can take a look and see, okay, all right, what happened during this update? And we can call RPM DB diff, and it will tell you which packages have been updated as part of the images uh, during uh, this update. So here you can see that we removed actually two packages and we deleted a bunch of them. So great, but what happens if, for example, there's a bug in KExec tools and you cannot use that anymore because it breaks your workflow on your system or your applications and you want to go back to the older version. Uh, so, well, the easiest version is you, you can tell RPM OS3 to roll back the system state to, to the previous version of the system. And you directly tell that to RPM OS3 with, uh, with the rollback command. And what it will do is essentially it will move up, it will go back to the previous version of the system. So when you call RPM history status, you see we have two versions because we still have the previous version available for us on the system and we can go back at any time. So that's what we will do right now. If we call RPM history rollback and dash dash reboot, it will roll back and reboot the system. It will see that we were back on the previous one. So that's almost instant. Just time for us to reboot. And we are now we're back. And if we look at the status here, so we're back to the system, to the image that we used to, first, we used to, to create the system. And the updates is right here, it's right on this, and that's the one we are running here, and that's the one that are available on system. So we just roll back and everything's fine. Uh, 
um, we can take a quick look at what Vincati is telling us. And Vincati is like, okay, uh, somebody's uh, all right. We uh, we are not going to update because we are uh, in a rollback situation. And there's like some strange error right here. All right, that's some bug. I'll have to check that one out. Um, and yeah, so essentially, Bengali is not going to update again because we've just rolled back. So Bengali is aware that we are, well, we're running an older version, but on purpose. So we are not going to update that one underneath you again because that would be bad. And we'll just wait until the next one comes in. And hopefully by the time this one comes in, you have time to report the fix. Uh, maybe a bug fix has been posted, a new package has been released. And so this one will get included in the next version. Uh, and uh, and then we, we can move on. So yeah, this is, this is essentially like skipping a version so that you can still the one that works and uh, and move on to the next one uh, which is uh, we, which hopefully will work too uh, yeah we do extensive testing but we we cannot test everything on the system so of course there will be bugs from time to time and that's like the last result uh, option that you have so essentially that's the idea about automatic updates and optional rollbacks if you need them um, so yeah that's uh, that's just my part uh, all right, we have um, a latest um, section, but I won't be doing that one because that would take us far too late. So I'll just like quickly show it. And it's the last session here about launching user level system units on boot. And you can do that at your own pace. Uh, it's essentially a self-describing example. I'll update it in, in, in the coming uh, 